Hello and welcome to Just Films and That with me, Josh Hallam. And me, Alice Oliver. This is the podcast where we talk about films that we think are underrated, underappreciated, or we just wanted to talk about them. We're also going to get stuck into some classic films that one of us maybe hasn't seen and maybe throw in some great guests along the way. So we start, as we do every week, with a random question. Um, Alice, do you have a favourite artist? And by which I mean, like, art, art, not like music. So, you know, know, Picasso or someone. So, you know what, Josh? I don't really think that I do. So I feel like my knowledge of art is very basic, but my interest in art is quite high. So, you know, we've got some great galleries here in the city, been to all of them, met so many artists through work, been to so many different exhibitions, and always really, really enjoyed them. And I could probably sort of, you know, identify a Picasso or a Rothko or a Keith Haring. Like, there are some that I'm more familiar with. But in terms of favourite, I don't think so. Like, I don't think I've really fallen for anyone's work and it's, you know, really kind of grabbed me or I felt a really emotive connection to it. But I wonder if that's because I've had quite limited experience and I wonder if maybe if I branched out a bit, I'd find someone who I do feel that way about. Why? Who's yours? Interesting question. Um... Quite the same, same as you. Like I don't, I don't have a massive, massive knowledge of art. Um, I, I also been to you know a few, quite a few galleries, you know, over the country, and like quite like to do it. You know, when you go to a city, see what, see what's about. And same with museums. Um, I'd say I quite like L. S. Lowry. Um, mm-hmm. I just, his, I just quite like his style. How simple it is. How it kind of captures the everyday kind of working, working man's life. Maybe it's um. Maybe it's because it's he's northern and I'm northern. I don't know. And I also quite like uh, Jack Vetriano as well. I think I'm saying that like Jack Vetriano. Do you know who I mean? The guy did one. There's, the, there's a couple on the beach and there's a butler holding an umbrella up. Anyway, I like okay, him. No, I like him. Yeah. I think he's yeah. Scottish. I think he's Scottish. Well, I'm asking you that because um, this week's film is based on a cartoon, um, and it is Casper from 1995. So. Spoilers if you've not seen Casper. Um, Alice, you picked this one. So what's it about? Why have, you, why have you picked it and what's it about? So it's Casper. He is the friendly ghost. He's haunting an old manor with his three uncles who are also there. And he's feeling a bit lonely. He wants a friend. So he sort of orchestrates this turn of events where a ghost psychologist and his daughter come to the home to sort of perform and, uh, you know, to exercise them from the building. Um, so they move in, it's Dr. Harvey and his daughter, Kat. So they move into the property with the ambition of sort of getting the ghosts to cross over to stop haunting the manor because the new owner of the manor wants to, you know, sell it and make loads of money. So it's just sort of everything that kind of happens as they move in. They get to know the ghosts. We get to know Casper. You find out more about sort of what happened, how, how he's in the situation that he is. Um, and it all ends up quite nicely, and it seems as though that Cat and the ghost psychologist are going to be staying because they become really good friends with the ghosts. Um, <laughs> but yeah, quite a quite an upbeat one most of the way through, I think. Um, is this one that you'd seen before, Josh? Yeah, so I'd seen it as a kid. So I don't. I remember watching it probably when it came out on video. So like, it came out in nineteen ninety five. So I probably watched it ninety six, ninety seven. So I was very young. I think I remember watching this at my childminders, but I don't know because it's like twenty five years ago. So <laughs> I don't really remember. So I'm intrigued to know because that is all I remember about this film is that I watched it and it's kind of a it's a kids. You know, people everyone knows Casper the Friendly Ghost, very very famous. Lots of cartoons, comics. Uh, director DVD films, all that sort of stuff. So, so why why did you pick this? So it popped into my head a few weeks ago, and I really can't remember why. I don't know what I was thinking about to kind of start thinking about the film. And then I just started remembering particular moments in it. And then I really remembered that it quite moved me as a child because it deals with, obviously, the subject of child death, but then also parent death. And I just found that those two things kind of triggered quite an emotive response in me, even at quite a young age. So I sort of wanted to revisit it and see, well, you know, how do they deal with these topics? Kind of really explore the story with more, you know, going into it, wanting to analyse it instead of just passively sort of watching it as a child. 
And so it was really to kind of explore those things. So I did like the fact that it sort of, that two of the key themes are obviously death. You know, it's a film about ghosts, so surprise, surprise. Um, And we get to know Casper a bit, and it turns out that he was, he was quite young, I think maybe 12 years old when he was out sledging all day and he was out for too long and he got really cold and he started getting really sick. So the gist is, I think, that he got pneumonia and then he died. So after that, you kind of find out a bit more about Casper's dad as he's going through this grief. And the fact is that he will do anything to see his son again. So he makes this machine called the Lazarus and he uses that to try and bring his son back to life. So I thought that was really interesting and and quite dark, really, for a child's film. But it's sort of balanced out with the kind of funny and silly ghostly elements because the ghosts, I mean, particularly uh, Casper's uncles, they are, you know, they're very silly, stretch, fat, so and stinky, you know what I mean? So that kind of lightens it a bit. But I did kind of appreciate the exploration into those themes. Yeah, I, you're you're absolutely right. When I um, when I was watching, it, I kind of wrote that down in my notes that I quite like the the message it, it has about grief and loss and and loneliness as well, and, and also the message about there's a there's a big uh, message in the film, like you say, about um, so in the world of Casper, if you like, you become a ghost if you die with unfinished business, and mm-hmm. kind of the I think the idea is that Casper and his uncles have been ghosts for so long they've kind of forgotten what their unfinished business was. So they have no way of finding peace and moving on to the eventual afterlife. Um, And I like that. I like that idea of, you know, don't, don't leave any stone unturned. Don't finish. Don't regret what you didn't do. That kind of thing. It reminded me a little bit of, of, um, have you seen Coco? Uh, Oh yes. The animation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a Pixar film and I I really love it. uh, Coco, but it's similar to that in the way it's about, it's about dealing with death particularly around, like you say, children being shown like almost a positive message on how to deal with loss, but also that idea of being forgotten and that idea of of dealing with grief. I really like that. I thought, um, yeah, I I thought that was really good about it because I'd never, it's not really something I'd ever thought about before in terms of the film. I just thought it was a nice kids film about a ghost, but like most I think every good kids film has a message in there to kind of educate or help them. You know, if you think of every great kids film, like I said, Coco, a, a lot of them are, you know, I'm not going to lie, a lot of them come to mind are Pixar. But if you think like Coco about dealing with death, Inside Out's about dealing with your emotions. Up is another one that kind of deals with loss and loneliness and getting older and that sort of thing. And this very much does deal with that idea of not uh, having unfinished business, but also then dealing with loss. Um, and I really like that about it. Because you see that in the dad's character as well. So Kat's dad, Dr. James Harvey, who's the ghost psychologist. So his wife has died, so Kat's mum. And he's sort of going on this obsessive journey of trying to find her because he believes that she is somewhere, that she is on another plane, that he is going to be able to find her somehow. But that goal of his um, is really destructive to Kat's life. Like she says that she's been in and out of nine schools within two years. She has no friends. You know, she's got nowhere to call a home. And I think that's really interesting. And their dynamic is really interesting as well. I think Christina Ritchie is absolutely brilliant. Considering for most of that film, she would have been shooting with no one next to her. She hasn't got a counterpart. She hasn't got a real life actor who she can react from and reading lines with. It's, you know, it's two tennis balls on sticks or, you know, it's a guy in a green suit or whatever. And I think she just did such a great job, especially considering how young she is. Yeah, I mean, she's only like 14, 15 at this point. So she'd already done the Adams Family in which she is brilliant in that as well, to be honest. She's a brilliant Wednesday Adams. Um, but yeah, you're right. So this is kind of before, I believe anyway, before your like your motion capture really became used by a lot of filmmakers. So it is like you say, it's just tennis balls on sticks. And the CGI for me was one of the standout things um, combined with the way it looked. But the CGI, it doesn't, bad CGI can really ruin a film and bad CGI is so, it's like any bad effect, but particularly CGI it's so obvious and it immediately takes you out of the film. It, like it immediately makes you go, oh, geez. it's like um, the first thing comes up, you know, like the end of the mummy returns where the Scorpion King comes back and it's the rock. And it's like, it's like a shit video game cut scene. And it, it immediately, the rock comes out on a Scorpion's body and you're like, <laughs> like, because it's just it so funny, it's funny it? and it takes you out of it. But in this, 
I thought the CGI for 1995 was was pretty seamless, really. I, I thought, like, the bit where he makes her breakfast and, like, I always think... Because you, you stop thinking about how they did it, but then, obviously, when you're looking at the film like we are with a critical eye and you think about the fact that someone's had to do this ghost making this young girl breakfast and putting a chef's hat on and frying eggs... I thought that was really good. I thought it was like a really um that was like a really standout scene as well. I like the bit when he um she faints and he like dips his the bottom end of his ghost body, his tail, <laughs> if you want, <laughs> into yeah, water. It, yeah, if you want, into water and then like twists it like a cloth over her face to wake her up. But obviously that would mean that some water is appearing from nowhere over Christina Ricci's head to wake her up. So I'm sure that I don't know exactly how they do it, but I, I, CGI, I think we've almost come to take it for granted now. If you look at a lot of recent films, it's it's in everything now, e even even films that aren't massive, massive budget films, it's in everything because even right down to just touching up the shot or whatever. But for 1995, I thought the CGI was was pretty fantastic. I mean, it really reminded me of... Um, this is, I suppose this, is, this isn't CGI, but what I mean is the way that the characters react with the ghosts. So the way that like... Uh, like you say, the, the dad played by Bill Pullman, James Harvey, has a has a sword fight with the with the uncles, and and Cat reacts with the ghosts. All is is it, it interacts with the ghosts all the way through. Reminded me a little bit of Roger Rabbit. Um, so you know, in Roger mm -hmm. Rabbit, obviously the characters react and uh, are, are communicating and interacting with cartoons all the way through it. And I just think it's yeah, I just think it's brilliant. I I think that's that sort of element of a film creates a really nice world. Particularly in a kids' film where you get to see them interact, interacting with a, you know something that's not there—a ghost, a, a, a cartoon, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I thought it was um, pretty fantastic. If I'm honest, the CGI for the time. Oh, brilliant! Good. That's high praise indeed. I'm glad to hear it. Glad I made you watch it. Um, one of the things that I really enjoyed. So it's quite near the beginning. Uh, so we're watching. So it's sort of a VT on the telly. Casper's watching it. I suppose he's very miserable. He's sort of got his head in his hands. He's like, "Why can't I have a friend?" And this kind of news VT comes on all about Dr. Harvey and his daughter. And it's like the ghost psychologist. And it's like, he's on a mission to find his wife in the <laughs> other world and all this. And he says, I, I think in it, he calls ghosts the living impaired, which I just thought was really funny. And then you cut to like this journalist and this camera right up in Kat's face when she's trying to go to school and they describe her as the loner daughter and she's like can you just leave me alone and all this and I was like I just found that whole sequence really amusing I thought it was a really interesting way to kind of to, to introduce Kat to Casper like it's just funny that a ghost would be watching the telly at, you know at that exact moment and just happened to see her and then he just sort of he makes it so but yeah, that, that I thought that was quite. Yeah, funny. it's very um, it's very cartoony, isn't it? Because obviously it is based on a cartoon, and I quite like the way that they kept those cartoonish elements and adapted them into live action. I like the fact that everything, like the house, looks very wacky. It looks almost just not quite real. Um, I think it actually is a real house because I think I'm sure I read in the trivia that they filmed the Backstreet Boys video there. But anyway. It all yeah, right looks, yeah. It all <laughs> looks very wacky, like like it's all very colourful and very cartoonish. Like things like um, at the beginning when they're sending different people in to deal with the ghost problem before before they hire um, James and his and 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 Cat. Uh, so they send a priest in, and he kind of comes out with his head turned one eighty, which when you think about it is an absolutely horrific idea for a kids' film. But they do it in that way that it's like a cartoon, you know, like you'd see. Tom and Tom and Jerry having a big lump on his head or Wiley e. Coyote slamming off a cliff into a, into the floor and holding up a sign, that kind of thing. And I like that they keep that element and they use CGI to do that because I think that's it's quite a brave decision to try and make a live action film as cartoony as this, but I think it pays off because I think it looks really good. Yeah, certainly. And going back to what you're saying about the house, I like that the house is kind of a character in and of itself sort of reminded me of the Adams family, a bit of the shining as well, yeah, you know, yeah. with the location, it's you feel like the location is living. Almost to a point as well, a film we did a while ago, the way, way back, with the water park as yeah, well, because yeah. it's such a like a, a, a pivotal, crucial part of the story. So I really liked that. And obviously the interior of the house is just brilliant. I would have thought that Tim Burton had designed it. It looked like something out of Coraline or out of Nightmare Before Christmas. Just really sort of really enjoyable um, special effects, I think, in terms of like what you're seeing on screen and everything that they did. 
because there's so many contraptions and stuff in the house, isn't there? Because the um, Casper's dad was an inventor. So you get all these scenes with like all these like gizmos and his wacky inventions. Yeah. Like, really yeah, it. he's got a, what's the machine he makes that basically gets you ready in the morning? Yeah. You know, they get, oh, what is it The called? get up and go yeah. machine? Is it the get up and something go machine like or something that, like that? Yeah. And it like you shaves you and brushes your teeth for you and stuff like that. But they, you are right. It's, there's a very Tim Burton feel to it. Like you say, like Coraline or Frank and Weenie or, or something like that. I think, I think you're right. And I, I think that's a really good point you make about the house being a character. There are a lot of films like the ones you've mentioned or like something like, um, like how sometimes you feel in a film like London is a character or Paris is a character. And that's something, again, it creates that world for you and really draws you in. It's so colourful and so kind of, it is kind of magical. So I want to talk a little bit about the cast. So we've said Christina Ricci is great. What do you think of the performances in general? All pretty good, really? right? Yeah, I really enjoyed them all. Um, obviously, there was a lot of young actors. I think they all did a really good job. I thought, obviously, Kat gets sort of picked on and bullied by this girl, Amber. I thought she did a great job. So Amber was great. We have Eric Idle playing a great sort of minion for Carrigan. And Carrigan, I thought, was brilliant as well. I thought she was a great villain, all in black, like perfect hair in a bob, bright red lipstick, sunglasses, kind of really sort of raspy voice. I thought she did a really great job. She's she's the standout for me. I thought she was an Ooh. excellent, like like you say, like cackling villain. She's got that great raspy voice. Um, and and I've, I've not seen that actress, Kathy Moriarty, in that much. She's in Kindergarten Cop, but I've not seen her in much else. But yeah, I thought she was a brilliant, like you say, like, cackling villain because she has quite a lot to do because she's quite understated and quite um like a femme fatale you know always smoking red lipstick black clothes that like you say quite uh demure and that sort of thing and then when she becomes the ghost at the end towards the end she has that she she literally becomes a big cartoon ghost and then she really comes alive ironically and and does this big massive vocal performance where she's laughing and cackling it's I think I thought she was really good, and like we've already said, Christina Ricci um, was very good considering how young she is. Eric Idle is quite—he's well, he's either quite selective with his film choices, or he doesn't get that much work. But I believe he's considering he's a member of Monty Python. He's probably quite selective, so I thought he was very good in this as well. Like he does, he plays the kind of uh, wet blanket sidekick type character, doesn't he? So yeah, I, I think you're right. I think the cast were good. Bill Pullman's an interesting choice for for the dad because. It's not that he gives a bad performance. He's quite cool. He's quite a cool... You know, he always plays... If you think of, like, we did Lost Highway, but he's a cool character in that. He did Independence Day around the same time. He's quite cool in that. I wonder if... Um, I do wonder if he was the first choice or if they were kind of looking for someone a little dorkier, you know, a little geekier, that, that sort of thing to play the dad. Because you don't... I'd, I've never, I can't really, I think I did watch the cartoon when I was little, but I'm not too sure what the, da, what the dad actually looks like. But Bill Pullman probably wouldn't be my, would have, if, if I was to read this script, I wouldn't think Bill Pullman. But again, it's not that he's bad. It's just that I imagine the dad's quite like, you imagine him to be quite a dorky character, quite, quite a kind of socially, socially inept character, if you like. Well, maybe it's for the mums. Like the mom's Maybe it's for the mask. It's like, yeah. oh, a newly widowed man. He's got, you know, this kind of floppy hair. He looks like he could do with a hug and a cup of tea. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Bit of <laughs> mom's totty. Yeah, a, yeah, exactly. A touch he of is, the, definitely. A touch of the, a touch of the Colin Firth to yeah. proceedings. <laughs> uh, I thought he did a good job, though. He did a good job at playing someone who really has almost given up. Yeah, like, he does a good job kind of, of bringing um, that that emotion, that kind of maybe that's what they're going for, that kind of broken element to him, like you say, like an injured puppy or something. Where he's, he, as you know, he's had this horrible loss in his life, and he certainly, again, he certainly gives a good performance. I just wonder if he's a little bit too, almost like a little bit too fit, a little bit too, <laughs> like, <laughs> too yeah, yeah. I don't know. There's also some there's a, there's some great cameos in this. You got uh, Dan Aykroyd as a Ghostbuster. You've got Rodney Dangerfield who was in Natural Born Killers, another film of your mm -hmm. choosing. You got Clint Eastwood. You got Mel Gibson. Um, yeah, some great cameos. You always know a, you always get great cameos in a in a kids film. It's like they want to do, do it, don't you? Probably because I mean, 
for for this one, I know that the fact that Steven Spielberg was involved kind of had, had a lot to do with it and, and that carried a lot of clout with it. But I reckon, I mean, cameos, it's the easiest job in the world. It's like, listen, we need you to record one line of dialogue. It's four words. When can you do it? We'll give you $10,000 for it or whatever. <laughs> so you think that they jump on it, especially if someone like Disney's paying. I know, obviously, that wasn't the case in this instance. Um, another thing that I really liked, I liked some of the language that the ghosts used to describe people. So like the kind of slurs that they like, come Is it fleshies? Living F- fleshies, they call so them, flesh, don't they? Got fleshies. Air sucking intruders, which I thought was brilliant, and bone bag as well. And also a little bit of swearing, a little bit more swearing than I'd remembered when I was a kid. I think Kat says piss off. Yeah, I think there's a couple, of... a couple of a couple of the word bitches in there as well. And I thought it was like, oh, that's a bit racy for a PG. Yeah, it is, it is, you're right. I noticed that when 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 cats had piss off and, and it really stuck out. I think, yeah, I think you are right. I think there's a couple of, there might be a, a, a shit in there as well, or a possibly a bastard, but I think you're right. I think, yeah, there's a couple of uses of the word bitch. There's a, a, another great thing about a kid's film. We've got the the bad guy being outsmarted by being incredibly thick at the end. Like, that eventually leads them being de- defeated because they essentially outsmart Kerrigan by her, getting her to admit that she has no unfinished business and essentially yeah. sending her into the afterlife against her own wishes. Yeah, very smart. They nailed that. It's like the cat quickly learned kind of the law surrounding the ghost. And it's like, oh, she can admit she's got no unfinished business. Yeah, very. We like like that. Like seeing the kids outsmarting the, the villains. It's exactly what you want. I mean, why do you think Home Alone's so popular? Yes, well, exactly. Oh, that was another one I was thinking of, actually, with the house is like a character. Yeah, it's like true, Home yeah. Alone. And it kind of had a few Home Alone vibes. I think because the way that the sound was and a lot of kind of the background sound and, and the the score if you will and um, it felt quite christmassy it and does it, yeah and i was really surprised to learn that danny elfman wasn't behind it because i was like <laughs> oh this sounds exactly like danny elfman but it wasn't i think it was horner it's james Someone so it's horner. james horner so james i mean yes. J- james horner is like one of my favorite composers he's probably best known for titanic uh, he sadly passed away, I think, in a plane crash a couple of years ago. And he wasn't, he was only in his 50s or 60s or something like that, I think. But he's, his his music is incredibly emotive and he does a really good job in this film. Again, I really, I thought the music was almost like another character because it was a really good job of using that really heavy piano. Like you said, like Tim Burton and Danny Elfman, it, 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 they do in their collaborations in the beginning bits with all the exposition, but also towards the end where there's more emotional climax and stuff. He uses really soft, you know, strings and piano and stuff like that. And it's it's really, I find his his music really emotive. One other thing that I did think was quite funny was when Dr. Harvey sees Casper for the first time, he properly freaks out. Mm. So he's meant to be a ghost psychologist. Like he's meant to have been like traveling the country, kind of helping these ghosts move on and having these other world encounters. Turns out he's just a massive fraud. <laughs> Yeah, that was. He's that obviously was, never seen a ghost before. That was something I noticed. That, that's actually probably something I've written down in things that I not necessarily disliked, but I was like, well, you know, what about this? Because, like you say, he sees Casper, he sees a ghost, and he absolutely shits himself. And I immediately, t- I immediately thought to myself, well, he's he's a ghost psychologist. Why is he scared of ghosts? That's like a zookeeper being scared of a panda or something like that. But um, so I, I do think there's a little bit. I mean, look. When we're talking about dislikes for a film like that, it's a kid's film. It's there to entertain kids. I get it. However, we do like to give a balanced argument. We do like to try and, you know, look at every film from every possible way. Bearing in mind it's a kid's film, I do think the script has a few holes in there. Like, it's it's missing. There's exposition in places that it makes it a little clunky, and there's no exposition in other places. So, for example, like we just said, the dad seems to be scared of ghosts. Does it clear up that he's actually a bit of a fraud? Or is it just that he hasn't actually seen a ghost before and it's kind of a new thing to him? Stuff like that. I don't know. Does he say, does it say he's a fraud? I don't think so. I don't think he ever they ever address it. I think you're just meant to infer from it like what, <laughs> yeah. what you do. And the fact is, this is obviously his first time ever seeing a ghost and he probably didn't even truly believe that they existed until that point. I wonder if maybe the encounters he has had that he believes they were real but obviously they weren't because obviously your imagination can play wild tricks. Yeah, on, maybe. Especially when you're grieving. That's true. That's true. Maybe, or maybe like in the world, in this world, you know, ghosts take all sorts of forms. So they do, 
you know, we do see from the film that Casper can turn invisible. So maybe he's coming into contact, but not with one that looks like the classic big white sheet type thing. What did you think? So my main issue probably was that some clunky issues with the script. What did you think of the script? And, and you know, is there anything you, you thought the film was lacking? I thought the script was mostly fine. You know, it was kind of funny when it needed to be, Mm. then sort of moving in other places. But some things I wasn't so clear on. So so Carrigan, the the film sort of starts with um, the reading out the will for this man, whoever owned Whipstaff Manor. And I think it was Carrigan's husband, sort of a really old guy who she married so that, you know, she could take half his stuff or whatever. I think it's her dad. Um, I think it's her dad. So it, oh, it's her dad, yeah, is it? Yeah, I think it's her dad, Not husband. Yeah. So it's her dad then. Right, so then, what? so at what point did the house sort of change hands between Casper's family mm. and then Carrigan's family? Or are Casper and Carrigan related? Oh, yeah, that's did true. That. Didn't think about that because it's never quite clear when Casper's supposed to have died because when you see his dad, his dad has got, you know, twiddly moustache and sideburns and stuff and kind of looks like, like late 1800s, but then Casper has a baseball card from the 20s and that's his oh. treasure. So I'm not oh, that. Yeah. That is another thing. I was like, so what? I, mean, I know it's again. I know it's not that important. The fact, what's important is that Casper's a ghost, not what what happened when he was a person. But even when he comes back and you briefly see him as a as a young boy, his clothes look kind of 1800s-y. But the baseball card, I think they say, is from like 1927 or something like that. I, I thought that was a bit strange. Is it ball, yeah, the baseball. Yeah, the baseball. Yeah. Is, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, interesting. Other things that I thought were quite inconsistent were the rules, like the ghostly rules, yeah. so what you can and can't do. So it's like, so you can turn invisible, okay, and you can go through walls sometimes, but you can't escape out of a vacuum cleaner. And yeah. And you're eating, but... It, so they're eating all that food, aren't they, the three uncles, having I mean, the sort of gross kind of breakfast, and it's all just, the food's all just kind of falling out of them and stuff. But then, but then, like, when he's flying past under cap, and she lies down on him, and then he's like a pillow for her. Just inconsistencies <laughs> yeah. in the law of the ghosts. So I know like, what you mean, you though. Know, I, I know we have to suspend our disbelief, <laughs> but I like I like the rules in magical things to kind of be consistent. Yeah, I'm the I'm the same. So like, why why are they eating if they so if if they have taste buds so I can enjoy fill food? Why don't they have a digestive system? Like, what's the oh. what's the point? Well, I wonder maybe if it's just like a routine. Maybe, yeah. In. I yeah. don't know. Yeah, because they, still, they also it's... seem to be able to pick stuff up. So, like, they yeah. can. Yeah, they, they can. Like, so yeah. they can make themselves solid. And, and so, yeah, I agree. It's like the, the. It's almost. It's weird because it's a little slow in places and a little unclear in places. And it's also, also, almost like some of the places where it's slow could have been at the beginning, perhaps building that world a little bit rather than. Uh, there's a lot of lingering scenes. There's almost like a little bit too much of a pause, a little bit too much of dialogue, but not enough exposition. So, but then on the other side of it, there's exposition in places that feels a bit clunky. So for no reason at the beginning, the only reason we know Kat's moved around school so much is because she just tells her dad that she's moved around schools a lot, which I get it. Sometimes you need to do an exposition dump and, and drop that out there so that you know. But why would she need to tell her dad that she'd been to nine schools in two years or something? Like he would know. Like, if you're going to do exposition, they get it in there a little bit more subtly. So it sounds either like a real conversation or maybe show us, don't tell us. I don't, it's it's strange. It just, that stuck out to me a bit like, oh, why would you say that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just like those lines of dialogue. It's just information that you have to get in there. And so it's like, right, it doesn't matter how. We'll just say that they're having a conversation and she feels the need to remind her dad that she's been in and out nine schools in the past few years. And also it's, there's things like... Does Casper fancy Kat or does he just yeah, want he, a friend? Because he can't, kind of seems to fancy her. If he does, that's kind of a little strange because he seems seems to be considerably younger than her. Like, like in terms of, you know, when you're a teenager in a couple of years seems like a lifetime. You know, if she's 15, she wouldn't go out with a 12-year-old boy. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I know he's yeah, a ghost and this is a ridiculous conversation. <laughs> But but he seems very young, but he also seems to want a friend. And he and it starts with him very much being, I just want a friend, I just want a friend. But then he also seems to be in love with her. Yeah, he is a little bit. Like he says, when she lies on his bed, he goes, there's a girl on my bed. Yes! Yeah. Like this. And like he's obsessed with sort of taking her to the dance and stuff. He definitely, 
Like, because the way he reacts when he sees her on the screen, I think he definitely fancies her, um, but certainly just completely besoft, like bereft with loneliness as well. And, and not just loneliness, but living with three other sort of ghosts or three other, you know, um, be- beings that you could communicate with mm. and form relationships with, but they're horrible to him. Yeah. So I do wonder, I do wonder about his, um, about his mental capacity. But yeah, I do wonder why none of them have crossed over. But I think the three uncles seem to enjoy. Just, do they enjoy just it? Just like being they ghosts. Enjoy being a bit horrible. Yeah. Yeah, and there's nothing. I mean, I think there's something to be said that the, you could certainly do a film in, about, you know, Casper finding his reason to cross over, if you will, because. You say the uncles seem to like doing what they're doing, but Casper very much, I think there's some satisfaction to be had there of him finally settling whatever his unfinished business was because how much unfinished business can a 12-year-old boy have? Yeah, no, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not the, not the person to ask, unfortunately. <laughs> 12-year-olds out there. <laughs> if you're 12 and you're listening to this podcast and you're a ghost, uh, can you get in touch with us? It's films and that <laughs> So... We'll move on to the critical reception shortly, but I believe before then, Alice, you want to take us on a journey. I do indeed. Josh, please follow me down the rabbit hole for this bit that we are going to call Alice Down the Rabbit Hole. Now, I usually like to focus on a particular actor when in the rabbit hole, but when doing research for this episode, came across a lot of interesting facts about the film as a whole. I'd forgotten that Mel Gibson makes a brief appearance in the film, along with Clint Eastwood and Rodney Dangerfield. Turns out Spielberg managed to convince Gibson and Eastwood to join in by saying he would also be making a cameo. Spielberg filmed his part, but it didn't make it to the final edit, something he was quite happy with as he isn't a fan of being in front of the camera. The ending of the film was rewritten by an uncredited J.J. Abrams, and it was only at this point that Devin Sawa was cast to play Human Casper. The voice of Casper, Malachi Pearson, was too young to play the ghost in human form. This was Abram's first time meeting Spielberg, an encounter that would assist in his future success. I haven't been able to find any info on what the original ending actually was, but we do know that there was no intention to show Casper as human. Like with most films in Hollywood, a sequel was planned, but due to Christina Ritchie and Bill Pullman's conflicting schedules, it was never to be, leaving Casper as the standalone masterpiece that it is, if you ignore the straight-to-video sequels, which we will. The film is considered to be the first feature length to have a CGI character as the lead, signifying a huge moment in cinema history, paving the way for the CGI-focused films that would follow. And that was Alice Down the Rabbit Hole with Casper. Brilliant. I think it is strange that there wasn't a sequel because I think it was fairly successful. But I did read, as you kind of alluded to then, that Christina, she was a little bit um, like, she, like she just didn't want to do it. Like she was kind of done, done with it, done, done with the idea of it. I don't know why, but I suppose she was kind of on the kind of she was coming to it to be an adult, I guess, wasn't she? So she probably would have a- think- aged out pretty quickly. Although, does she need to be a kid? Maybe not. I don't know. But yeah, I think that's interesting because you would have thought that like most that you say most successful films it would end up with a sequel yeah yeah i was i I assumed that it sort of had and that i just kind of missed them like when i found out that you know deep blue sea also had a two and a three and a four and a five and how many so i was like oh yeah there must be cast for sequels but no but there were there were obviously a couple of straight to (laughs) straight to video ones but nothing that was like a true successor i don't think as so we've done films deep blue sea tremors which have 800 sequels between them, as well as Butterfly Effects 2, 3, 4, through to 17. But Casper, oh, yeah. a film about a friendly ghost, couldn't couldn't muster a cinematic sequel. <laughs> yeah, funny, that, isn't it? Funny that works, huh? So uh, we'll move on to talking about the critical reception then, and then we will decide uh, if it can take its place alongside the other great films in the underrated uh, pile. So, Alice, um, you haven't seen The Critical Reception. How do you think it did, you know, roughly? So I feel like it would have done quite well. And I think given everything we kind of discovered about, you know, it being the first film with a CGI lead, I think you can really tell how much work has gone into it. And it hasn't aged poorly at all. Um, I thought the story was good. I thought it was quite funny. I feel like the acting was great and a lot of great performances from very young actors as well. So I feel like I I would have given it like an, a low eight, like maybe an 8.2 or an 8.3. But I, I feel like it probably didn't get that. And I feel like that might be a bit high. 
Yeah, so you're right. So on IMDb, it gets 6.1 out of 10 at the time of recording. And on Rotten Tomatoes, the audience give it 49%. What? And the critics give it 51%, with a lot of them kind of saying things like it's too reliant on CGI. What? Um, you know, reliant on uh, cameos, film, but then it's also quite dull and quite kind of slow. I think that's a little bit harsh. Um, but do you, I'm guessing from your gasps that you think that's wrong. I am honestly shocked. I am really shocked. The only thing I think that shocked me this much was when Bigby and St. Louis got 100. Yeah. That is, I feel like that is so unbelievably harsh and I feel like, oh, uh, I'm livid. I, so I don't, I, so for me, I don't think it's unbelievably harsh. I do think it is harsh because... <laughs> yeah, so, okay, now let's let's realise something. I watched this when I was a very young child, <laughs> probably a very happy child, having a lovely time, and this film made me feel lovely. <laughs> so maybe it's a bit of that. I will, maybe it is a nostalgia well, that's what, But that's what makes films good. You know, a lot of people like films for the nostalgia. There are films that, that loads of people love that I don't because of nostalgia. But I do think that is a bit harsh. I think those critics are doing their job and looking at it critically as we are. But I think you need to remember who it's for. You need to remember it is for kids. So for me, I think it is a little bit, in terms of the script and it as a piece of storytelling, is a little bit all over the place in parts, a little bit slow in parts, a little bit meandering, and could do with a little bit more exposition. However, I do think it's they've got good performances. I think it's got great effects, and I think it looks amazing. So, and I think that more importantly, it's got a really good message for kids. For me, it's not a it's not a classic family film. It's just short of that. But I think that those critics have been too harsh. So I I think it is underrated. Um, and I definitely think it's underrated. I think those marks are really harsh. I'm really surprised. <laughs> Okay, so uh, there we go. Another one to add to the uh, ever-growing pile of underrated films, which is why we do the bloody podcast, is to point out underrated films. So there we go. Yes, Casper, definitely underrated. I think some of those reviews a little bit mean, but I will get over it. Josh, what are we watching for next week? Next week, we will be watching Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator. Oh, interesting. And I will say, okay. I will say no more about that. Okay, very exciting. Look forward to that one. So, yeah, The Great Dictator next week. Uh, if you'd like to get in touch, we'd like to hear from you. Please do um, give us your suggestions. Tell us what you think of the films we've picked so far. Um, and uh, if you could give us a little five-star review on iTunes or a review of any kind or tell your friends, we would very much appreciate it and give you a big old cuddle if we ever meet you in person. Um <laughs> If you'd like to get in touch with us, as I've already said, it's films in that pod at gmail.com. Uh, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram at films underscore that or films in that pod. Um, Alice, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you so much, Josh. Pleasure as always. And it's goodbye from me. Cheerio. Bye. <laughs>